Hey guys, welcome back to Control System Laboratories. Now in our last video, we built this little robotic car, and then we used it to demonstrate the differences between open loop and closed loop control system. Now starting with this video, we're going to step through the design process of choosing the correct sensor, modeling the system, uh, designing the controller, and then ultimately testing it. However, starting with this video, we're just going to begin to understand the sensor that we chose for our vehicle. Now I'm using the MIN IMU-9 version 2 uh, inertial measurement unit from pololu.com. And almost all of the information that you need on this sensor, and pretty much every sensor, can be found in the data sheet that can be searched for online. However, if you're not really familiar with reading data sheets, they can be a bit intimidating at first. Therefore, in this video, I'm going to walk you through the data sheet for our particular rate sensor, and then just kind of point out some of the things that I look for when selecting and modeling a MIMS gyro. Now, no matter which sensor you have, you can usually just do a search for the product number and the word data sheet, and you're going to find lots of hits for it. Or in most cases, the place where you bought the sensor will have a link to the data sheet directly. I have the MIN IMU 9 version 2 sensor suite from Pololu, and specifically, I'm using the MIMS gyro on it, which is the L3G D20. And under resources, they have a link to that exact data sheet. The first page is usually an overview of the features, and it's going to give you a quick idea as to whether the sensor will work for you. I'm going to skip this page for now because each of these features are covered in pages below in more detail. But once you understand how each of these affect your design, this overview page is really handy for comparing multiple different sensors with each other. And here we come to the block diagram and pen description of our sensor. Now you may not normally spend much time looking at this block diagram, but it is nice to be able to see generally how the sensor is set up. The first part of this diagram shows the actual hardware that converts rotational motion into an electrical signal, voltage. The changing voltage then goes through an analog low-pass filter to reduce the high-frequency noise in the signal prior to going through the analog to digital converter. The digital signal is then filtered again, depending on the user's selectable configuration, and then sent across either an I2C or SPI bus. Let me show you real quick how this analog low-pass filter helps to reduce aliasing in our system. Let me start by redrawing part of that block diagram. We have an analog low-pass filter, which then goes into an analog to digital converter, and then finally goes through a digital low-pass filter if the user selects it. Now let's say you're rotating the sensor back and forth in your hand in a sine wave. And to make things easier, we'll say that that sine wave is exactly 1 hertz. And we'll say that the sensor is running much, much faster than 1 hertz. So the ADC converts the changing voltage into a digital reading at each of these red X's. Since this is much faster than the input frequency, the output signal looks a lot like the input signal. But as the sample time of the gyro gets longer and longer relative to the input frequency, things start to change. Here we're sampling four times faster than the input frequency, but the output still has that same general shape. Problems start to arise though when your sampling time gets slower than about half of a wavelength of your input signal. Here I've drawn a sample time of about three quarters of the wavelength and you can see that the output signal is at a much lower frequency than the input signal. Now forget what I wrote right here in the green and the purple. I wrote frequency accidentally instead of sample time and then I tried to go back and correct it but it didn't really work out. So what's drawn in the picture is correct, what I wrote here, not as correct. So what this is telling us is that input signals with higher frequencies than the sample time of our system get aliased down to lower frequencies. Or more importantly, the energy at those high frequencies, which is generally noise, gets carried along through the ADC at lower frequencies still impacting your system, which is not very good. And once those higher frequencies have been aliased down to lower frequencies, there's no way to get rid of them using a digital filter. And that's why you need to get rid of all of that high frequency noise in the analog realm using a low pass filter. So the analog low pass filter reduces high frequency noise before it can get aliased down to lower frequencies. And now if the user wants, they can select additional digital filtering. All right, enough of this. Let's get back to the data sheet. 
In our case, we don't need to worry about the pin description because the min IMU9 takes care of all of that for us. But this would be important if you wanted to use this sensor in your own circuit design. All right, now we're getting to the good stuff, the mechanical characteristics of the gyro. Now I want to write a little bit about this, so I'm going to copy this figure into the blackboard so I can write at the exact same time. There we go. So let's start at the top. The measurement range has a symbol of FS, which stands for full scale. This is user selectable, and it's the maximum rate that the gyro can output. We have three scales to choose from, 250, 500, and 2000 degrees per second. Let's say we selected 250 degrees per second, which is slower than one revolution per second. And if you spin the gyro at one revolution per second, the gyro is still going to output 250 degrees per second because you've saturated the scale. However, if you had chosen 500 or 2000 degrees per second, then the output would have read 360 degrees per second like you wanted. So at first glance, it seems like we want to select the highest scale there is so we can measure the widest range of rotation rates. But there's a problem with that, and we can see it in the sensitivity. We have 16 bits of data for each reading. One bit is for the sign of the reading, either positive or negative, and the other 15 bits represent the magnitude of the data. So in order to represent a larger value with these 15 bits, we need to increase the size that each bit represents. When we increase the size of the bit, we decrease the sensitivity of the sensor because it can no longer differentiate between values that are smaller than the least significant bit. Or in this case, 15 zeros and a 1 in the least significant bit is equivalent to 8.75 milladegrees per second when the measurement range is plus or minus 250 degrees per second. So there's a trade-off between range and sensitivity. With that in mind, I would choose the smallest scale that still meets the expected operating range of your system. In the case of the car, I'm going to choose 250. This sensitivity also changes over temperature. In this case, it changes about plus or minus 2% between minus 40 degrees Celsius and 85 degrees Celsius. If you're operating within fairly consistent temperature ranges, then you don't need to worry about this change. And since the car will be, I'm going to skip this for now. All right, let's give ourselves a little bit more drawing room here. Perfect. Now, the digital zero rate level is the static bias in the reading. If you set the gyro on a non-rotating table, or zero rate, and you took a series of gyro readings, you'd probably see that the average reading is not zero. Biases in MIMS gyros usually come from small stresses on the sensor when they solder them onto the board. They get bent slightly and a small bias appears. Luckily, according to the manufacturer, the bias changes very little over temperature and time, so once you calibrate your sensor, you can subtract that bias from your readings and get a new zero rate level of zero. If you're concerned about the temperature change with the bias or with sensitivity, you can do temperature compensation. And that's why there's a temperature sensor included in this unit, so that in software you can compensate for these changes using just the output from the temperature sensor. And if you're concerned about the change over time, you can just recalibrate from time to time. Now the amount that the bias changes over time is called the bias instability, and a lot of gyro manufacturers include this value in their datasheet. Now something that I find interesting that I want to share with you is that when you set a gyro on a table, it's still rotating in inertial space since it's on the surface of the Earth, which is rotating. The Earth rotates at 15 degrees per hour, or about 4 milli-degrees per second. This is slower than the smallest sensitivity of the gyro, so it can't measure Earth rate. However, if you have a more sensitive gyro, you're going to have to take that into account when you're calibrating it. All right, I'll just move this down once more, and then we'll continue on to nonlinearity. The nonlinearity of a sensor is very important for linear controller design. Remember that the less linear a sensor is, the less accurate the linear model of the sensor will be. And if you design your linear controller based off of a bad model, then you're going to have a bad design. Let me plot something for you. If we assume that there's no bias error, and there's no noise on the sensor, and if you don't rotate the sensor, then you're going to expect zero counts out, which would be this dot at the origin. And if we're using a measurement range of 2,000 degrees per second, and we rotated the sensor at 70 degrees per second, you would expect 1,000 counts out. 
and then likewise for 140 degrees per second, 2,000 counts, and negative 140 minus 2,000. So if you connected all of these lines, it would be a nice linear line, where the slope of the line is the sensitivity of the sensor. But the real sensor doesn't behave this nicely. Instead, the graph might look something like this, where the max difference between the linear line and the real value would be 0.2% of full scale. This means that just from the nonlinearity of the sensor, you could be off on your readings as much as 4 degrees per second with a scale of 2,000 degrees per second. This is another reason why you want to choose the lowest scale possible for your design. Okay, let's move on to rate noise density. This is a measurement of the amount of unpredictable or uncalibratable noise of the gyro. It can be frustrating to try to compare the noise levels of two different gyros because different manufacturers tend to define the noise with different methods. If you define the noise using the fast Fourier transform, you're going to have units of degrees per second per root hertz, just like this manufacturer did. And this is the density measurement since the noise in degrees per second is specified per band of frequency root hertz. However, they can also define noise using the power spectral density, which has units of degrees per second quantity squared divided by hertz. Luckily, converting between these two is easy, you just square or take the square root, respectively. The third method, which is the one I prefer, is called angle random walk, and this has units of degrees per root hour. Again, this is a measurement of noise, and it can be related back to both the power spectral density and the fast Fourier transform methods with these equations. But the bottom line is that the lower these noise numbers are, the better the sensor. And you can use these conversions to compare the noise levels between multiple sensors. Let me briefly go over what angle random walk is, so at least you have an idea of how that represents noise. Let's take the output of the rate sensor and integrate it over time to get an angle. Basically what we're doing is estimating our angular position by summing up our rate over time. So if the sensor reads one degree per second, we'd expect our position to be one degree after one second, and two degrees after two seconds, and so on. If the sensor has no noise at all, and we didn't rotate at all, then the output would be zero degrees per second, and the summation over time would be zero degrees, not moving. But if there was noise on the sensor, we'd expect that the integrated angle to randomly change over time, or randomly walk around, in some unpredictable way. The higher the noise, the more wild the random walking, and the more uncertainty you would have in exactly what your real angle was. This random walk over time takes the shape of degrees per root hour, just like the units of angle random walk. There's a really great explanation of this by Crossbow, and I've linked it in the description below. So I definitely recommend checking that out. So now we move on to the digital output data rate. This is the number of gyro samples per second that you can read. This sensor has four different rates, 95, 190, 380, and 760 hertz. The faster you sample the gyro, the faster the input signals you can sense and respond to. Again, there are downsides to sampling a gyro too fast. Mostly you put a strain on the throughput of your processor since it has to read and process all of that data, and input-output processing takes a lot of time relative to other operations. Also, the higher the frequency, the more noise you're subjecting your system to. We can demonstrate this visually with a low-pass filter. If all you're interested in are really low frequencies, you can attenuate all of those high-frequency data. But the higher the frequency that you're interested in, you're bringing along all that extra noise as well because you can't attenuate those high frequencies since you need that information. So again, I would choose the lowest possible rate that works for your particular design. And lastly, I think that the operating temperature range is pretty self-explanatory. This range of temperatures should cover almost all of your projects. But if it doesn't, then you either need a new sensor or you need to start thinking about adding a heater or a cooler to your system to keep this particular sensor in its operating temperature range. All right, we'll stop right there for now. In the next video, we'll continue through the rest of the data sheet and then also get into a little bit of the modeling of the gyro. Now, if you have any questions or comments on data sheets or what I've said in this video, leave them in the section below and I'll try to address them in the next few videos as we close out reading a data sheet. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of these future videos, and as always, thanks for watching.